Father, we do just lift up this time, and, and uh, God, I just pray again that as we look at this, and I pray that we'd give us a greater understanding of you and your holiness and your righteousness and your faithfulness, and Lord, that it would cause us to trust you more, fall more in love with you, and just have hearts, God, that are drawn towards you and close to you. And I know, Lord, we can look at things and kind of sometimes get discouraged, but God, our hope is in Jesus Christ. And we thank you for this gift of salvation that you've given us. And God, we just want to grow in the grace and the knowledge of who you are and have a greater understanding of you. So I pray that you would anoint this time, bless this time, and God, that you would be glorified in it. And we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Hey, this morning as we were singing about the Lamb, you know, that's kind of a good uh, uh, theme for the book of Revelation. The book of Revelation is about the Lamb of God. And in verse, or verse in chapter 1, we saw the Lamb was the revealed. John saw the vision of the Lamb. And then in verse, or chapters 2 and 3, we see the church of the Lamb and the different churches. And then in 4 and 5, we see the Lamb in glory and the Lamb worship. Those are some great chapters. Now we move into chapter 6 through chapter 19. We're going to see the wrath of the Lamb and the wrath poured out, which always isn't a great thing, but we need to understand, and some people get a little uptight, but here's what we need to know. I think we don't understand the whole idea, why does worship happen before wrath? And it's because in heaven, they have an, a, an understanding of the holiness of God. And once we get a grasp of the holiness of God, we can understand why his wrath would be poured out and why he's going to pour out his wrath on a world that hates him and a world that has rejected him, and he's going to do that. So again, it's not, it's not a misunderstanding, hey, we need to worship him because he is worthy and he's a great God. So as we think about that, now as we enter into chapter 6, and as I said, 6 through 19 are basically what we call the tribulation period. And it's that if you were with us in the study of Daniel, in Daniel chapter 9, we found out about the 70 weeks, and then we have that one seven-week period that's not happened yet. That's what's going to take place in these chapters we're going to look at. So Daniel chapter 9, chapter 12 speaks about it, Matthew chapter 24, and we'll kind of tie that in a little bit, and then it's repeated in Mark 13 and Luke 21. So that's what we're looking at, and some people, it's interesting, some people say all of this has been fulfilled in history, and I got to argue with them, because you cannot read through this and read these details and list a time where these things have been fulfilled, because they haven't. When we get into it, we'll see it a little bit more and it'll become more obvious. And then some people say, well, it all happened in 70 AD when the temple was destroyed. Here's a news flash. John wrote this in 90 AD. So it can't, John didn't say this happened 20 years ago, right? This is gonna happen in the future. So obviously it couldn't have happened then. So as we read this, listen, we get an understanding. It's that time of the tribulation period. And then I know some people go, well, aren't we gonna be raptured before the tribulation? Yeah, I believe we will. And then they go, well, then why read it? Well, because chapter one tells us if we read the book of Revelation, we'll be blessed. And I want to be blessed. I don't know about you guys, but I want to be blessed. And I like the idea of being blessed. And more importantly, it's the Word of God. And when we read the Word of God, we have a better understanding of God. Hey, we don't read the Word of God to set dates and get time frames and get names. We read the Word of God to know Him and fall more in love with him. So kind of that's what we're doing this morning. And then again, I kind of want to emphasize, I sort of understand that uh, this is not a great Mother's Day message. And, uh, but you know what? I think it's because moms are strong. And so that's why we're doing this, and that's why we're going to look at it and then go through it. So verse 1 says, Now I saw when the Lamb opened one of the seals, and I heard one of the four living creatures saying with a voice like thunder, Come and see. Now I'm going to stop for a minute because as I read through this, 
I'm not going to read come and see. In the original language, it's come. So when the, when the living creature says something, he says come, not come and see, because it's kind of implied when he says come and see that he's calling John to come and look at something. But the living creature is saying come to the four horsemen. Every time one of the creatures will say come, talking about that specific event to take place. So I'm just going to read it that way from now on. And then he says, listen, he says with a voice like thunder, come. And I looked and behold a white horse. He who sat on it had a bow and a crown was given him. And he went out conquering and to conquer. Now, some people say this white horse, and this part represents Jesus, because in John chapter 19, if you read, and we read about Jesus, he comes on a white horse. But everything else about it is the only similarity between chapter 6, verse uh, 2, and chapter 19 is the white horse. Jesus, on chapter 19, is in a white horse, and he comes with a sword, this person has a bow. Jesus, when he comes, has a crown of sovereignty. This one has a crown of victory. And Jesus, when he comes, brings peace. And lasting peace, if you read the rest of these seals, there's turmoil and chaos. So I think this is a type of Christ, right, called the Antichrist that's about to be revealed. Now, I don't think it's the Antichrist on the horse. Some people say that it's the Antichrist riding a horse. And I don't think so because all the other, the other three horsemen are not saying this when we don't identify them as somebody. I think each horse and horseman represent an event that is going to take place. And the event here is someone who comes and does bring peace, but not lasting peace. And notice he comes with a bow but what's missing? Yeah, you guys are brilliant. The other two services just sat there. So arrows, so here's what that tells me. He's not coming to conquer in a military sense or in a violent sense. He's gonna come and bring peace and conquer with peace. This person who's coming, this representation here that's coming is going to be at a time, listen, I think it's just a crazy, crazy time that we're looking at, and he's going to come in the midst of some chaos, and he's going to bring peace. And according to Daniel chapter 9, he's going to make a covenant with Israel, and he's going to promise Israel certain things. And he's going to make that covenant, but he's going to break it in the middle of that 70-year period. But he's going to come and he's going to bring lasting peace. I sometimes get excited when I see certain things taking place and, and you see some things set up. And right now with all that's going on in Israel, it gets a little bit exciting when somebody's talking about, hey, we're going to bring a ceasefire, we're going to do that. Here's what I know. When all of that peace, total peace comes to the Middle East, we need to start jumping because the rapture's coming. And you need to practice, right? You go out and jump up and down. So the rapture practice, I call it. And we're getting ready. So when they start talking that way, it kind of excites me a little bit. And I get a little bit like, man, is this the time? I think we're close to the end. Amen. Well, here's what I know. We're a lot closer to the end than John was, <laughs> right? And, you know, and so I think we are. And I don't read this to try and set a time. I read it to try and understand what's going on around me. So peace is going to come. He's going to bring that peace. And then as we go work through these chapters, we're going to find out he breaks that peace treaty. But he comes and he brings that peace in, in chapter 9. And then 2 Thessalonians gives us some other clues about this individual. In chapter 2, uh, verse 3, it says, Let no one deceive you by any means, for that day will not come unless a falling away comes first and the man of sin is revealed. Now you can get more detail if you want to go online and listen to our teaching in Thessalonians. But bottom line, here's what he's saying. The church is going to get distant. The church is going to have this great falling away and then the man of sin will be revealed but here's what we know he's going to be revealed after the church leaves 
because if he was revealed, listen, if somebody came and did some of the things we're going to talk about, the church would go, that's the Antichrist. And the church can't be here and name him because I think people who know their word and know their Lord will recognize the Antichrist. We're not going to be fooled by the Antichrist. As a matter of fact, later on in Thessalonians, here's some ones who are going to be fooled. It says, the coming of the lawless one is according to the working of Satan with all power, signs, and lying wonders, and with all unrighteous deception among those who perish because they did not receive the love of the truth. Those who reject the truth are going to be fooled by him. And this individual is going to come and he's going to bring that utopia, so to speak. I believe there's going to come a time where on the Temple Mount, when we go to Israel, sometimes we get on the Temple Mount, sometimes we don't. But you get on the Temple Mount, right now the Temple Mount is governed and ruled by the Muslims. And they have the Al-Aqsa Mosque and the Dome of the Rock. I believe there's going to come a time where there's going to be a temple and it's going to be built right next to those and everybody's going to get along and everybody's going to sing Kumbaya. And it's not going to be good. So this deceptive peace is coming and it's going to happen. And somebody, you know, a lot of people relate it to the time and hey, I wasn't around then. I might be old, but I'm not that old. When Hitler was gaining control, if you read your history, and a lot of us don't like history, but I think it's important, when Hitler was gaining control, guess what? Everybody loved him. People were into it. We have a a few German families that come here, and they were here first service, and they said, can you quit picking on Hitler? And I go, no. (laughs) Hey, people loved him, and he was deceitful. And when it came undone, It came radically undone. Hey, was he a type of the Antichrist? Yeah, I think he was. And the Antichrist is going to do the same thing. There's going to be that similarity where people are going to believe him and he's going to have a good spiel and people are going to buy into what he's saying and hey, everybody's going to go, what's wrong with peace? What's the matter with you when you don't accept this? Skip Heisek said it this way. This is a great way. He says, the Antichrist will have the oratorical skill of John Kennedy, the inspirational power of a Winston Churchill, the determination of a Joseph Stalin, the vision of Karl Marx. He will have the respectability of a Gandhi and the military prowess of a Douglas MacArthur and the charm of a Will Rogers and the genius of King Solomon. That's all going to be wrapped up in this charismatic person. And he's going to come and listen, man, he's going to bring that peace. And then people will say, is he here now? I don't know. Well, I do believe this. I believe every generation has an antichrist, quote, in the waiting. Because here's what I know. Satan doesn't know when the end is coming. Here's what my Bible tells me. The only one who knows is the Father. And so he doesn't know. So he's always got somebody he's preparing. Remember, Satan is preparing the Antichrist and getting him ready. So I think every generation he has one. Well, in John, in 1 John, listen to this. He writes, little children, it is the last hour. So if John thought it was the last hour 2,000 years ago, it's definitely the last hour now. So he says it's the last hour. And as you have heard, the Antichrist is coming. Even now, many, many Antichrists have come. So therefore, we know it's the last hour. So I believe that's what we're looking at right now in in the next phase of history. That's what's going to happen. So kind of keep your, you know, your ear to the ground and look what's going on. And like I said, man, when we see, I don't know about you guys, but man, what's going on in Israel right now is mind-boggling to me and what's happening and how it's affecting the entire world especially the United States of America. And what is going on in our country on college campuses, I just, I can't, I can't understand it. I can't put it together. Although, I was around in the 60s. And we were good at protesting. Right? Many say if you remember the 60s, you weren't there. So some people from the 60s get it. People from not the 60s don't. But here's the thing. It seemed like there was a cause that our country was involved in something specifically. 
We were involved in the Vietnam War, so we were against a man, and then that changed not just against a war. We just hated the man, and now all of a sudden, we all became the man. It's weird now, right? It's kind of reversed everything. But man, you look now, have you, have you ever paid attention and watched when they interview those kids that are protesting now? They didn't even know why they're protesting. They have no idea. They don't, they'll ask them. And I, watch, I watched one guy five minutes going to maybe 20 different young people. Why are you doing this? Here was their answer. We don't talk to the press. He goes, I'm not the press. I'm a YouTuber. We don't talk to you. And they don't want to answer. Why? Because they don't know why they're there. They're just there. And that's scary. And that's going to kind of go into some of the other things. So I'm, I'm blown away by what's going on. And here's what bothers me the most. I feel our country is going to turn its back on Israel. I feel we're right on the brink of doing that. And here's what my Bible says. I will bless those who bless you, and I will curse those who, who curse you. And I think the United States of America is in a very precarious position right now with decisions we're making, and we need to pray for our country, and we need to pray uh, you know, that... that you know, the people in power will make the right decisions. So enough political stuff. That's what's going on. So now we have the next torch. So you got this utopia. Kind of imagine you have this perfect utopia going on. Everybody's happy. And then verse 3, when he opened the second seal, I heard the second living creature saying, come. And another horse, fiery red, went out, and it was granted to the one who sat on it to, t to take peace from the earth and that people should kill one another and there was uh, given to him a great sword. So you kind of get the idea. Fiery red, right? War, destruction, bloodshed and bottom line, that's what's happened. You have this perfect peace and then all of a sudden it's destroyed. Now I don't think this is the middle of the tribulation. I think this is a time where there is gonna be global warfare every place but Israel. And why do I say that? Listen to Matthew 24. Jesus says, you will hear of wars and rumors of wars and see that you are not troubled for these things must come to pass, but the end is not yet for nation will rise against nation and kingdom against kingdom. So I believe, listen, there's going to be all kinds of wars breaking out because they're going to finally realize this guy duped them. And they're, now they're going to have wars break out and things happen. And, you know, even right now, how many wars are going on around the world? I mean, we might be aware of a few of them, right? I mean, you know, most of us have forgot about the Russian-Ukrainian thing because it's not in the media anymore because Israel's in the media. But how about the wars in Africa? How many wars are going on in the, you know, on the continent of Africa and happening? And that's happening all the time. But we get kind of cold to it, right? Hey, it's not happening here. It doesn't affect me. So it's not so tough until it starts hitting home. So you can hear of wars and rumors of wars. Who was Jesus talking to when he said that? Jews. So it's not happening in Israel according to what we're looking at in three and four. It's happening all around them. And there's bloodshed and chaos and then what happens when you have war? Well, then verses five and six come into play. You start having war, and it says, when he opened the third seal, I heard the third living creature say, come and see. And I looked, and behold, a black horse, and he who sat on it had a pair of scales in his hand. So now we're looking at the next horse. And the next horse is a black horse, which kind of, again, represents what's going to happen famine. And so now what you have, a pair of scales. The scales are representing economic balance or imbalance. It was what takes place. And again, when you have massive warfare and wars going on, you know, the economy in those places stinks. And the economy gets horrible. And you know, we might think the economy is bad here, but listen to the economy at that time. Look at verse 6. And I heard a voice in the midst of the four living creatures saying, a quart of wheat for a denarius and three quarts of barley for a denarius and do not harm the oil or the wine. So here's what I'm looking at. I think if we're looking at famine and when he says a quart of wheat for a denarius, a quart of wheat would be the equivalent of what it would take to feed one person. 
So you have that quart of wheat, you have enough food for one person, but it costs you a whole day's wages. So what does that mean if you have a family of five? Kind of tough, huh? Who gets to eat and who doesn't get to eat? All of a sudden, now you're choosing who gets to eat and who doesn't get to eat. And then he says, oh, but you can get three quarts of barley for the same price. So you could feed three people with barley, but the problem with barley, it's not nutritious. You can't be sustained by it. Hey, you can get by a little bit, you can fill your stomach, but you can't get sustained by it. So here's what we're looking at. We're looking at famine. And we're looking at, and you know what? In America, even the people who are hurting in America, we don't understand famine. We don't understand not having it, period. We got a little bit of taste of it when COVID hit, right? Because we went to, you know, we went to the stores that we're used to having, you know, a choice of 4,000 cereals. It's ridiculous. We, went, we, were, we were just traveling and we went in a grocery store and there was an aisle like from here to the end of the parking lot out there full of cereal. I thought, how many cereals do you need? And I don't have kids right now so I never go to the cereal aisle but I don't know why we walked down it but it's nuts. But there's gonna come a time where that's not gonna be and that's not gonna happen and like I said, we're, we're kind of not used to it. And notice he says, don't touch the oil or the wine. Those are luxuries. And it doesn't matter. You don't have to touch them because only the rich can buy them anyway. So you don't have to mess those up. We're talking about messing up the food for sustenance and taking care of ourselves and nutrition. When I was in India one time, and I've shared this before, and this is heartbreaking. I was in India. We were in what they call a community, and I think it was like 250,000 people. In India, that's a community. You know, it's like, you know, there's people everywhere. But we're in this, quote, community. And this guy came up and asked us to pray for his wife who had tuberculosis. And when we saw her, she was just a, I mean, she was just a skeleton. It was sad. And we asked him, why don't you get medicine? And you know what he said? He said, I can either buy medicine for my wife or food for my kids. But I can't buy both. We don't know that kind of life, but that's coming. That's what he's talking about. That's gonna happen. You're gonna have to make choices and they're gonna be tough choices. And then, you know, the people who are well-to-do, they always seem to be better well-to-do even in those tough times. Now comes the really hard part. In verse seven, he says, when he opened the fourth seal, I heard a voice of the four living creatures and of the four living creatures saying, come. So I looked and behold, a pale horse. So now we have, and it's interesting that, the, you know, the people who you read, every commentary I read had to talk about this pale horse. And I'm thinking, why can't we just have a pale horse? That wasn't good enough. It's a greenish, yucky colored horse. And people were describing it like this. It's kind of like what death looks like. Right? Dead people don't look good. I'm always amazed, and sorry if this offends somebody, but I'm always amazed when you go to a funeral and they go, he looks so good. I always think, he looks so dead. Like, he doesn't look good. I don't care. I don't care how much makeup. I don't care what you do. It's just like, no, they don't look good. <laughs> they look dead. I guess that's this pale horse, right? Because it says he's on a pale horse, and death and it says, uh, uh, and, and the name of him who sat on it was death, and Hades followed him. So now we're talking about not just famine, now we're talking about people dying. And we're talking about death, and death is physical, Hades is spiritual, right? So that's what's going on. And then he says this, because it's important, and power was given to them over a fourth of the earth to kill with sword, and, and with hunger and with death by the beast of the earth. So hey, look, this is gonna be different. This isn't people, and this kind of cracks me up, this isn't people dying of natural causes. One fourth of the world population is gonna be wiped out, what did he say? With the sword, with famine, 
and with pestilence or plague, and the beasts are going to be involved in cleaning things up, so to speak, and eating on them. So it's going to be a horrific time. So right now, right now, there's almost 8 billion people. So I'm going to round up to 8 billion because it does math easier for me because I don't do math well. So what did he just say? A fourth of the world's population is going to be wiped out. So four goes into eight, how many times? Two. Thank you, you guys are going to help me. So here's what that tells me. Two billion people are going to die within that first three and a half years. Two billion people. We were kind of in awe of what was going on with COVID, right? Do you know how many people died during COVID? A little over 7 million. That's a lot. I'm not minimizing that, especially if we lost somebody. But 7 million is a far cry from 2 billion. And that's what's going to happen. So don't tell me that's already taken place. When people say that's already happened, there's never been a time in world history where one-fourth of the world population has been wiped out. It was close with the, with the bubonic plague and then the influenza in the late uh, 1700s. It was close, but those affected just one continent, Europe. That's not come, you know, worldwide. Two billion people are going to die. And that's what he's telling this is going to happen. And they're not going to die by, and I love this, people call, hey, they died of natural causes. They don't die of natural causes. When I read that, I know if somebody says that, I think, I don't think death is kind of, I know we're all going to die, but don't call natural causes. Just say they died because they're dead, you know? So, hey, this is by the sword, by famine, by plague, and by wild beasts. That's going to go on. Now, why is that happening? Why is the fourth seal happening? Because the second seal and the third seal started it. Global warfare, global famine equal billions of people dying. And so that's going to take place. Again, happy Mother's Day. <laughs> i got to lighten it up a little bit. But man, are you reading this and understanding and hey, this is just the beginning. We read when Jesus said, this is just the beginning. So we need to understand, this is going to happen. And this is going to take place. Why is it going to take place? Not because God's a vengeful God, and not because God is losing control or losing his temper. It's going to take place because man has asked for it. Amen. And man has shook their fist at God and, you know, do you ever ask yourself when you read something or maybe something happens to you personally, do you ever say, why isn't God doing something? I think we all ask that at times. Oh, he's going to do something. And this is it. This is what we're reading. God is going to bring his wrath upon planet Earth for all the injustices that have been done throughout time. Now, one more thing before we wrap this up. Is a lot of people say, these seven seals and then the seven uh, trumpets and then the seven bowls are all the same thing. I don't believe that. They're saying they're just different views. I don't believe that. I believe they're progressive. I believe it's, hey, this is bad. It's going to get progressively worse. And yes, I will say this. All of the wrath is wrapped up in these seven seals because when he opens the seventh seal, that starts the seven trumpets. And when he blows the seventh trumpet, that starts the seven bowls. So it all wrapped up in the seals. And who's opening the seals? Jesus Christ, the Lamb. He's bringing this wrath. But listen, saints, our hope is Jesus Christ. And that's where we have to put our hope, and that's what we have to think of. Now I want to read for you, I want to read for you Matthew 24, because I, a lot of people tell me that they don't understand Revelation. It's just too hard. And some people will read Matthew 24. So I'm going to put the four horsemen into the first part of Matthew 24, and listen to this. So in Matthew 24, verse 5, it says, For many will come in my name, saying, I am the Christ, and they will deceive many. That's the white horse. Then Jesus goes on and says, and you will hear of wars and rumors of wars and see that you are not troubled for all these things must come to pass, but the end is not yet for nation will rise against nation and kingdom against kingdom. 
That's the red horse, the second one. And then there will be famines. That's the black horse that we read about. And then he says pestilence and earthquakes in various places. That's the pale, pale horse of the destruction. But listen to this. All of these are the beginning of sorrows. This is just the start of what's going on. So we need to understand that. So listen, Jesus spoke of it very clearly in Matthew chapter 24. And now John is explaining it. And we need to, only, we need to be people that the only hope we have right now is in Jesus Christ. Our hope is not in politicians. Our hope is not in you know, certain governments taking over. Our hope is Jesus Christ. And you know, we need to be careful on who we follow and what we do but we need to know that. Now, I want to close with these four thoughts because this, is, this kind of really hit me. If the world chooses to believe a lie, then God will send them the Antichrist because we're talking about God bringing judgment on the world. If the world seeks to kill and destroy, and I put in parentheses babies, right, in the womb, then God will give them anarchy and rule because that's what's going to happen, or mob rule, that's what's going to happen. If the world demands more luxury to gratify its lust, then God will give them an economic upheaval and an inflation that they desire. And then the last one, if the world demands power and control, they will receive a brutal end of unrestrained power. That's what we're looking at. So we need to decide which side of the line we're on. Are we in the world and believing the world system? Are we believing Jesus Christ and walking with Christ? And we're going to find our hope is in him and him alone. Let's trust him. And then I want to, I want to emphasize this. We need to be men and women who are sharing the gospel of Jesus Christ. Because there's a lot of people right now that don't know Jesus. And this is what they're facing if they don't know Jesus. So we need to bring them to Jesus and give them understanding. So this shouldn't bum us out. This should fire us up. And we should be people, I'm going to go out and I'm going to grab as many people. Don't you wish you could force people? Wouldn't it be good if you could just grab them? You're saved now. So, I mean, sometimes we feel like doing that, right? And we want to get people. So let's be men and women who reach out and share the gospel of Jesus Christ because he is coming back. Amen. And when he comes, it's not going to be some, you know, the beginning before he comes is going to be horrific. Amen. Now, he's going to come for his church and take us, but then when he comes to set up his kingdom, we got to read, you know, uh, what do we got to read? Another 19 chapters before we get there. So we're going to spend some time in bleh. So if you don't like bleh, Skip church for about three months. No, don't do that. So anyway, happy Mother's Day. God bless you guys. Let's stand up and pray. Father, we do thank you. We thank you just, Lord, that as you confront us and as you bring us to the place, and Lord, you don't leave us comfortable or, or complacent, but God, you bring us to that place where, Lord, we have to see the reality of what's going on. And God, I thank you again for this challenge in this, this uh, beginning of this chapter. And Lord, how you bring things into clarity that sometimes, God, we don't want to see, but we need to see. And I pray, I pray for myself, and I pray for my brothers and sisters, that this wouldn't just be a doom and gloom thing, but it would be something that would, would drive us and encourage us to share the gospel of Jesus Christ with our world, with our neighbors, with our coworkers, with our family, God, that we would be the light in the midst of the darkness and that you would be glorified in us. And I'm gonna ask everyone to stay in that attitude of prayer for a couple more minutes. And if you are here today and you've not accepted Jesus Christ, you've not asked him to forgive your sins, you've not asked him to come into your life and take over your life, then you know what? Man, today is a day of salvation. And maybe, you know, maybe your mom talked you into coming to church with her. You know, I kind of get that. Sometimes our moms come on and your mom brought you to church and you're sitting here or standing now saying, why did I come? Well, you came for a reason, so you could hear the truth. And the Bible says the truth will set you free. 
So I just want to challenge you. If you're here and you heard this truth, then today is the day of salvation. Right now is a time where you need to make a decision and you need to decide if you're going to follow Jesus or reject Jesus. And we want to give you that opportunity to begin to follow him. And that all begins with you coming to him and being real and honest. And the first thing that you have to do is you've got to admit to God that you know you're a sinner. That's where it starts. And as you understand that and admit that to him, then you need to be sorry for your sin because your sin has offended a holy and righteous God. And because you've offended him, what you deserve is his eternal wrath. And hey, that's scary. The great news is that Jesus Christ took the wrath that you deserve, the wrath that all of us deserve, he took it upon himself. And now today, here's what he says. If you trust me and believe me, your sins will be forgiven. They'll be blotted out and forgiven. You just have to trust me. So if you want to do that, I'm going to lead you in a prayer. And you can say this prayer with me out loud, or you can say it silently. Volume doesn't matter, but here's what does matter. Your heart. This needs to be sincere. You're not just uttering magic words to say. You're asking God to change your heart and to take control of your life. So if you want to do that, say this prayer with me. Again, out loud or silent. If you're backslidden and you need to come home, if you're backslidden and you read this today, I'm sure you're going to want a front slide. You're ready to come home. So come back to Jesus. If you're watching online, you can say the prayer right where you're at. You don't have to be in this building. So let's say this prayer. Jesus, today, I confess to you that I am a sinner. I'm sorry that I sinned against you. And right now I'm asking you to forgive me. Jesus, thank you for dying for my sin. Thank you today for your forgiveness. And now I want you to come into my heart and change me. Jesus, would you come into my life and guide me? I'm asking you to be my Lord and my Savior.